didn't work. I, uh, I used to work as a paramedic for the city and county of Denver. I was back in the 1980s. And uh, one evening after my partner and I had dropped off a patient at Denver General Hospital, uh, we got that kind of call that you hate to get as a paramedic uh, for a police officer down at number 40 South Pennsylvania in Denver. <clears throat> this is a, a picture of the house. Um, it's, this is a daytime picture, but this call happened just, uh, just after sunset. So it was, uh, it was the beginning of nighttime when it actually happened. Apparently a woman who was in the house called the uh, 911 saying that she was afraid her drunk husband might kill her. And so they, uh, uh, they sent a, a patrol car. As the patrol car arrived, they noticed uh, two signs in the front of the house. Um, this house has been harassed by the Astro Hole Division of the Denver Police Department for 20 years, and uh, an upside-down American flag was posted next to it. And those of you with a, a military background will, will recognize that this is an international symbol of distress, um, <clears throat> in this case, probably emotional and psychological distress. Um, the patrol car um, that arrived had two officers in it, Officer James Weir who was a rookie officer in the Denver Police Department. Back then, uh, what Denver would do is they would have officers in the training academy for a month, and then they would send them out for uh, two weeks to ride with a, a seasoned field training officer, um, and then they would uh, go back into the academy for the last four months worth of their training. So Officer Weir was in that two-week period uh, right after only a month's worth of the Denver Police Academy. Um, his partner was a 16-year veteran of the Denver Police Department and uh, <clears throat> a training officer. And when they, uh, when they arrived, um, they pulled up uh, across the street uh, from the house where the call came in from. And uh, they uh, looked up and noticed behind the screen door, there was a man standing there with a long-barreled weapon. So they got on the radio and uh, said, we've got a man with a gun. <clears throat> uh, officer Weir. Uh, deployed and uh, took up a position of cover uh, behind this four foot uh, tall concrete reinforcing wall. Um, the house is up on a, a little bit of a hill giving him a, a touch of a high ground position here. And his uh, partner took up a position of cover uh, behind a parked car um, across the street. Uh, the guy in the house uh, opened fire and uh, the officers uh, started returning fire, um, got on the radio and said, uh, we, have, uh, we have shots fired. And um, Officer Weir uh, looked up over the, the top of the, the concrete wall uh, to return fire and took a shotgun blast to the forehead and was uh, dropped on the ground in between the sidewalk and the concrete reinforcing wall. Uh, so the call went out for, uh, for Officer Down. Uh, my partner and I were only four blocks away. This is very close to Denver General. And <clears throat> uh, we responded and took up a position of cover behind this four-story a uh, tall apartment complex at the end of the block. Um, as uh, <clears throat> officers are arriving, as you can imagine, from, uh, from all over the city of Denver, um, active gunfight going on uh, back and forth between the assailant and the officers arriving on the scene. Um, I did a quick peek around the edge of the apartment complex and saw a friend of mine, uh, Sergeant Ron Sampson, who was the district uh, sergeant for this part of Denver, um, and he had uh, pulled his uh, patrol car uh, down uh, here, down at the end of the street, and he was making his way along the houses, uh, trying to get to the downed officer. Um, just as he, uh, he got to Officer Weir, um, Sergeant uh, Sampson took a, a shotgun blast to the chest and was dropped on the ground uh, next to the rookie officer. So now we've got two officers down in the middle of a, a very active gunfight. Um, and I, I noticed that some of the officers who were arriving on the scene kind of arrived with kind of, kind of wild-eyed uh, panic uh, energy, and others were just like, cool, calm, we're going to take care of business and get things done. And <clears throat> during, this, uh, during this part of the gun battle, somebody got on the police radio and said, hey, all these, all these street lights and the houses, uh, the lights on the front porches of people's houses, they're backlighting our officers. Um, so all of the panicked officers on the, on the scene uh, instantly started shooting out all of the street lights uh, up and down the block, uh, rendering the neighborhood into, into more darkness. Uh, just then, the uh, Denver Fire Department uh, arrived on the scene, uh, and they pulled up behind the apartment complex with us, uh, as did the Denver SWAT team. 
Um, and the SWAT team commander is one of these very uh, cool, calm, incredibly level-headed leaders. Um, he uh, grabbed onto me and said, you know, I think I've got an idea for how we can uh, get these officers out of here. Um, so we uh, hatched a plan uh, along with the captain from the police department. And we, we basically uh, took one of the, the ballistic shields uh, from the SWAT team and put it uh, up in the driver's side compartment uh, of, the, uh, of the pumper. And myself, uh, my partner, two EMTs from the fire department, and uh, the SWAT team uh, rode on, on this side of the pumper, on the side away from the, from the gunfire from the house, and uh, uh, made our way down in front of the house. Uh, the SWAT team commander said, I will give you uh, 30 seconds worth of uh, nonstop weapons fire uh, into the house uh, to give you time to extract the downed officers. So we did that five, four, three, two, one count and uh, launched um, the, uh, the automatic weapons fire. My partner and I uh, and the two EMTs went in parallel uh, to the weapons fire and then in two teams, we each grabbed uh, one of the downed officers, uh, drug them out behind uh, the pumper and then backed the pumper down um, to where another ambulance had arrived here behind the uh, apartment complex. And we loaded the respective officers into each ambulance and headed for the trauma center at Denver General. Uh, Officer Weir was um, <clears throat> mortally injured and not able uh, to recover or, or survive and was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at Denver General. Uh, Sergeant uh, Sampson was awake when we, uh, when we first extracted him, um, but he uh, went into cardiac arrest as he was moved over to the uh, trauma bed uh, at Denver General. Um, they immediately uh, cracked his chest open and were able to uh, repair the buckshot wound in his heart and uh, defibrillate his heart and get it restarted. I sent him off to the operating room. Uh, he uh, made a, a pretty miraculous recovery enough to the point where he was able to go uh, back to work on the streets of Denver and finished uh, the last four years of his career. And he now runs an antique shop in a small mountain town in Colorado. Um, and, and after this incident, uh, they, uh, they brought in all the, the critical incident stress debriefing process for all of us who were involved. They invited the dispatchers and all the officers and all the paramedics, firefighters, everybody who was involved in the, in the situation to the debriefing. Jeff Mitchell, who had created crit critical incident stress management, actually flew in uh, from Maryland to help facilitate the process. And, and it was good to to get together and, and, and process things and, <clears throat> and, and work on, uh, on taking care of ourselves. And uh, um, that night, I, I still had four hours left in my shift, but I took the, took the rest of the shift off um, and I had a couple of uh, days off afterwards. And I was certainly um, sad um, that my, uh, my friend was uh, critically injured and fighting for his life in the trauma ICU at Denver General and that Officer Weir had lost his wife or lost his life with a young wife and a, a six-month-old infant at home. Um, but I was able to uh, return to work and, uh, and recover and, and did okay. Uh, some of the people, you know, it took them two or three weeks um, before they were able to come back to work and do okay. And there were uh, two of the officers that responded who were never able to come back to work at all and ended up taking an early disability retirement from the, from the police department. So I got to kind of asking myself, so what's, what's the difference between those officers that, that show up and are calm and, and, and cool versus the ones that show up with a, with a, a bit of panic in their eyes? What's, what's the difference between the people that are, are sad but seem to recover okay uh, versus those that end up with a, a severe psychological um, and emotional injury? And trying to understand the difference between those two um, really led me to discovering and learning about resilience and, and stress management and trauma-informed therapy. So as you, uh, as you travel along the, the road of life, resilience is really um, that work that you do to build your emotional, psychological, and physical strength so that when a stressful situation happens, you're better able to handle it. Stress management techniques are those things that you can do in the moment of a stressful situation to dial down uh, your sympathetic nervous system response and, and be able to function more effectively and uh, take better care of yourself. 
And then uh, for people who end up with some level of, of injury, and that, that happens a fair amount of the time, uh, the trauma-informed therapies, the uh, prolonged exposure therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, EMDR, uh, those kinds of things are available to treat people on the other side of a particularly stressful situation if they need it. For today's lecture, we're just going to focus on the middle one. Um, we're going to focus on the stress management piece <clears throat> because in the middle of a pandemic, that's kind of what's, uh, what's really up for folks. And, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, what, what is it that causes you stress and, and, and how does that relate to you? And, uh, and your, uh, your uh, team here at the, the state office and along with some other colleagues uh, did a, a survey of EMS providers in Kentucky and I'm, I'm, uh, the survey has not been published yet. I'm not going to go over all the details, but I want to just share with you a few of the highlights um, that were in that survey. Uh, 1,481 people uh, responded to it, which is a pretty, uh, pretty good sample size uh, for the state of Kentucky. Um, folks have uh, big concerns um, uh, about others that they may have exposed to the disease, folks they, they may have brought it home to. Uh, there's a fair amount of concern about uh, job security and, uh, and income uh, among providers. Um, there's a, a large amount of uh, frustration about uncertainty of the future. And I think, you know, this is a, a feeling that's uh, shared by um, people all across the world um, that we just, we don't know how this disease is actually going to evolve. We don't know if herd immunity is actually going to work. We don't know if the uh, uh, if a vaccine will be developed in time or and, and what level of protection it will offer. There's a bunch of, a bunch of things that we just don't know about, second waves and those kinds of things. A um, number of people expressed uh, anger that they feel at times about uh, uh, people um, being, being negligent, about not using their, uh, their PPE correctly, uh, maybe about other people not disinfecting uh, equipment correctly. Um, people not washing their hands appropriately. Um, one, uh, one of your participants said, you know, putting my mask in a bag is BS. Um, being unable to, to see my grandkids is a significant stressor. And I, th I think this next comment really kind of summed it up uh, for pretty much everybody all, all across the world uh, working in, in healthcare. He said, uh, or she said, I'm not sure what the, what the uh, gender is of the person who said this. Uh, I have a normally stressful life and career. COVID-19 has ex increased that stress exponentially. There's no escape from its effect. The unknown aspect of it is greater than anything I've experienced in my nearly 30 year career. And I think that uh, speaks uh, truth for a lot of us. And um, so there's the, those professional aspects of stress and then just being out in the world. You know, it used to be that the stress of EMS was primarily at work, but um, this pandemic, um, you know, brings it into our personal lives in a in a in a crazy way. Um, and I, you know, I think six months ago, if I was in a grocery store and somebody sneezed or coughed, I, I probably wouldn't even notice. It probably wouldn't even register for me. Um, but I was in uh, one of our one of our local grocery stores here a couple of weeks ago, and there was a woman in the produce section. She had a surgical mask on, um, but she started to do the. <gasps> Kind of, kind of thing like just before she was going to sneeze, and she pulled her mask down and sneezed into the open air um, right over the organic Honeycrisp apples, actually, and then put her mask up um, afterwards. And um, there was kind of this, you know, collective um, emotional hijack from everybody who was in the area of like, really, you don't know, get the reason for your mask. Um, so just, you know, ask yourself a couple of couple of questions to just kind of assess kind of how this has affected you. And many people, it's having effects and you don't, you don't necessarily notice it, but if you if you've found yourself getting uh, upset by uh, little things uh, recently or um, that you're maybe overreacting to situations you wouldn't have reacted to before or uh, been a little more irritable maybe with uh, your kids or the people you love, um, or, or notice that it, it takes longer to kind of calm down after uh, after a situation than it did beforehand. Those are all kind of clues that maybe stress is uh, infused more into your life than, than you might think it has otherwise. And so, you know, the news is full of uh, pictures like these of 
you know, folks uh, suiting up in their personal protective equipment uh, to be able to do the work they do. And, uh, and when I, and I see these images, you know, I, I immediately think of soldiers, you know, gearing up with their body armor and uh, helmets and other uh, protective gear, uh, getting ready to go into combat. And, and I know I've, I've got a lot of friends who have uh, uh, served in the, the armed forces, and some of them uh, think this, this analogy that, uh, that dealing with COVID is like going into to combat or a war zone or battle um, is a really offensive comparison. Um, and uh, others, uh, friends of mine who have seen combat say, this feels exactly the same as it did when I was headed into Fallujah or wherever they uh, had been uh, involved in, in combat. So um, this, this comparison is not uh, in any way, shape or form, any disrespect to the folks that have served. Um, why, I, why I share it is I think that there's a lot we can learn from how the US military, the army in particular, uh, prepares soldiers uh, for dealing with stressful situations, how they manage it during the situation, and afterwards. But before we, we get to that, you know, just remind you of the, the, the kind of basic things that we've all heard about stress management. You're supposed to eat healthy, you're supposed to exercise and get your, your heart rate up and get your sweat on a little bit, at least, at least 30 minutes a day. You're supposed to get plenty of, of deep and restful sleep, avoid caffeine and alcohol and other, other substances. Um, socializing is a key part of of stress management, and, and these things are all, all absolutely true, um, and, they're, and they're less available uh, during the time of coronavirus, or they're available differently in ways that might, might not be as easily accessible. Um, so uh, learning uh, from our, our military folks, there's a, there's a group out of Walter Reed um, that has uh, created this framework called Battle Mind. And in, in Battle Mind, they talk about the nature of combat as being intense, life-threatening. Fear is common. It's, it's actually expected. Um, it impacts everybody psychologically and emotionally, even if you think you're really tough and immune to that kind of stuff. Um, it has a tremendous impact on families. And um, in some cases, it sets you up for moral and ethical challenges. And I know as we have uh, re-examined cardiac arrest management protocols across the country um, or uh, the use of aerosolizing uh, treatments for people with reactive airway disease um, that for some people it's that that's that's presented some uh, some challenges and, and thankfully it, it hasn't happened very often in the US um, like it did in, in Italy where you've got too many uh, really sick patients that need to be ventilated and not enough ventilators to use so you have to make a decision of who you're going to try to resuscitate and save and who you're going to let go. Um, so the objectives of the battle mind training are to, to really give people the strength to face the fear and do the work they need to do anyhow. Um, we, we need people to work in EMS, in emergency departments, in police cars, in fire rigs. Um, that, is, that is essential for, for our society. Um, and so we need people to feel the fear and go ahead and, and go to work and, and, and take care of things anyhow. It gives you the skills to dial down your emotions in the moment when you're, when you're feeling a little bit jacked up. Helps you recover faster so that when uh, the stress inevitably uh, comes in, in various waves, um, it allows you to kind of get back on your game quicker. Uh, build your resilience so that you can deal with stressful situations easier and uh, helps you lead more effectively. And I also think it's, it's uh, vitally important uh, to remind you as I uh, share the, the strategies uh, and the rest of this presentation, these are not things I invented myself. Um, I am primarily a student. And as a student, um, my role is to share with you uh, things I've learned from other folks. These are uh, just some of the, the bright folks that I have uh, learned from. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about them, my uh, website, uh, combatcovidstress.com. Um, it's got links to their, uh, their books and many of their research studies and articles. Um, and as we, as we talk about techniques uh, for managing stress, I want you to think back for a moment uh, to when you learned to drive. Um, and if you just think, who was, it, who was it that taught you to drive? And do you remember what kind of car you learned in? And 
And for me, it was the neighbor lady, Mrs. Tierney, across the street, because my parents were too nervous to be in a, a vehicle with me behind the wheel. And uh, she had like a 1967-ish uh, Ford Mustang, um, which is what I, I used to, uh, to learn to drive um, with the, the clutch and the, the three-speed shifter. Um, many of the young people on the, on, on the call right now don't understand what a clutch or a three-speed shifter is. Um, you can ask your parents about it. Um, but my recall of learning to drive is what we refer to as explicit memory. Uh, it's something I pull up from the past. I know it happened in the past. Um, whereas today, when I drive and when, when you've driven in the, any time in the last year, um, it's memory that actually allows you to drive. It's memory that allows you to use the accelerator and the brake, use the steering wheel without running into other things, um, use your, your turn signals, unless you're in, in California where turn signals seem to be optional. Um, I think people in Kentucky are pretty good about using their turn signals, but uh, um, you know, all of those kind of aspects of operating the uh, motor vehicle, you just, you just know how to do. You don't, you don't recall them. You don't think, okay, now how do I use the brake again every time you sit in the car? You just get in and drive. Um, and that's what's referred to as implicit memory. It's memory that you don't experience as being pulled up from the past. You just know how to do it. And my bias is that stress management techniques are really only helpful when they're part of implicit memory. Um, because if you're in a stressful situation and you have to go, oh, now what was that thing I, I heard in that webinar um, and that I have to do, you know, your cognitive capacity is really dependent on your state. And if you're calm and relaxed, you have access to more memory than when you're stressed out in the moment. So you want uh, to pick one thing out of this session to become automatic, something that you overlearn. Uh, my, my guess is that everybody on this webinar uh, could probably do uh, CPR even if they've been awake for 72 hours and their mind is kind of in a fog. I'll bet you could still do CPR at, at, at a pretty high quality because it's a skill that you have overlearned, overpracticed, and you just know how to do it. Um, so that's what you want to grab for one of these stress management techniques um, to, to do that. So. As we, uh, as we head into that, I want to review real quickly how uh, stress works in your brain. Uh, I find that people who understand the neuroanatomy of stress management are better able to manage their stress. So this is your, uh, your brain stem on a PowerPoint on a, a Zoom webinar. Um, some of you are old enough to remember that joke. Um, but the brain stem um, is responsible for your basic life functions encourages you to take a breath now and then, regulates your body temperature, uh, essentially differentiates you from a head of cabbage. Next part of the brain to evolve is the limbic system. It's a collection of organs in your brain uh, that are, are parts of your brain uh, that are responsible for all of your emotions. So love and joy and frustration and anger, sadness, all of those live in your limbic system. Next part of the brain to evolve is the neocortex. Um, it's that outer edge of your brain, uh, the thinking part of your brain. And from the perspective of stress management, we're primarily concerned with the prefrontal lobes of the neocortex, those parts of the brain that are right behind your forehead. They're also known as the uh, smart brain uh, or the executive center. Um, and one of the, the many functions they provide is impulse control. Um, so if you're uh, driving along in traffic and somebody cuts you off and your impulse is to roll down the window, honk the horn, and wave at them using just one finger. Um, it's your, uh, your prefrontal lobes of your neocortex that cause you to go, maybe I shouldn't do actions that are likely to, to get me shot by another driver and cause you to, to choose a different way to react. Um, it is also the first part of your brain to be impacted by the consumption of alcoholic beverages. Um, and so people who have uh, uh, said or done things that later they're embarrassed about while intoxicated. It's because of alcohol's impact on the prefrontal lobes of your neocortex. Uh, inside uh, the, the center of your brain uh, is an organ called the, the thalamus. It's a gland. Um, and the thalamus works like the 911 communication center from your, for your brain. It takes in information from your eyes and your ears and distributes it to various parts of your brain for analysis and, and possible action. And right next to the thalamus are two little almond-shaped pieces of neurologic tissue called the amygdala. 
And the amygdala, when you understand how the amygdala works, um, it gives you incredible control over your own emotional life and increases your ability to be effective dealing with other people in your world, both personally and professionally, that might be emotional. The amygdala is like your body's lifeguard. It's its century. It is on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it is constantly scanning every sight, sound, smell in your environment, and it is asking three questions of everything it interacts with. The first question is, is this something I can mate with? The second is, can I eat it? And the third is, is it going to eat me? Is it a threat to me? Um, so if it gets a no answer to these questions, it does nothing. It just sits there. But if it gets a yes answer, it activates a cascade of emotions or a cascade of neurochemicals that result in emotions, um, strong feelings. So if the answer to can I mate with it is yes, it fires off the parasympathetic nervous system, which is mediated by the vagus nerve and inspires feelings of love and joy and happiness. Um, this is also known as the relaxation response. Um, on the other hand, um, if it gets a yes answer to the question, is this gonna eat me? This is a threat to me. Um, it fires off the fight or flight response. Uh, most of us learned the fight or flight response uh, way back in EMT school. Um, but uh, research has, has also shown that some people freeze and others faint. Um, so there's four possible uh, responses as part of your sympathetic nervous system response. And, and all of us have a different level of reactiveness uh, with our uh, uh, stress response. Uh, some people uh, can go through very stressful situations and hardly react at all. Um, other people, a very minor stimulus can, causes them to jump. A leaf falling outside can cause them to startle. It's not good or bad, it's just a different level of reactiveness. And, and each of us, um, depending on what state we're in, have a different level of reactiveness. If you've stubbed your toe while going to the bathroom at night, um, and then you stub your toe a second time, the second time you're gonna react a whole lot stronger than you did the first time because your, your neurologic system has been conditioned for that. Um, all mammals have this system. It's what allows us to identify threats and helps uh, keep us alive. Um, the distinction with human beings is that humans have this big brain that allows us not only to identify the same threats as other animals, but we can imagine threats that don't even exist or uh, continue to replay and re-loop uh, threats that did exist that are no longer there. Um, this is uh, one of the, uh, the roots of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and this is what causes the, that negative stress that we worry about. And it, uh, it comes in all different flavors. You can call it vicarious stress or critical incident stress or burnout. It's, these are all the same wine in a different bottle, if you will. And um, it causes a number, of, a number of different challenges for us when you have uh, poorly managed uh, threat-related stress. Um, it, it's, a, it's the root of inflammation in your body and, and a, a whole uh, host of diseases that we deal with in our world, the majority of them, um, have their roots in inflammatory disease, um, causes oxidative stress for your cells, those little mitochondria the little battery packs in your cells uh, get damaged due to inflammation. Um, the telomeres, which are the end caps on your DNA, uh, each strand of your DNA has these little end caps on them that are called uh, telomeres. And uh, one, of the, one of the people who discovered them, Alessia Espo, uh, one of my uh, colleagues at UCSF, uh, she describes them as uh, being like the end caps on your shoelaces. And when you're born, your uh, telomeres are pretty long. And over time, they shorten up, and this is the essence of aging, and as the precursors to disease. So as they get too short, and if the ends fray, it is the recipe for cancer, inflammatory disease, and is the base of aging. Um, and since they were discovered 35 or so years ago, there's been a lot of really interesting research um, that has been done on telomeres and telomere length. Uh, there are a number of things that actually uh, shorten your telomeres, and a number of things that will actually lengthen your telomeres. You can actually uh, decrease your risk of disease and actually prolong your life and, and lifestyle um, by uh, lengthening your telomeres. And so the things 
uh, like chronic threat stress, smoking, eating processed foods, eating foods with added sugar, all those things your mom told you you probably shouldn't do, those are all things that have been shown to shorten telomeres. On the other hand, eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, getting deep, restful sleep, spending time in nature, and practicing some kind of mindfulness, whether it's meditation or prayer or whatever it is that works for you, um, have all been shown to, uh, to lengthen your telomeres. And, uh, and before this uh, uh, session got started, uh, Mike and I were, uh, were talking about summer uh, with our kids and he uh, he said I'm gonna I'm gonna spend uh, most of my summer with my kids out in the woods where they're away from other people and and, and get them outdoors and and there's fascinating research uh, my favorite one is, was done in San Jose there was a medical conference uh, 500 people at a medical conference and uh, they used a, a random number generator and divided the group in half and they gave half of the group a box lunch and sent them out to the park behind the conference center. And the park had uh, a, a rose garden. Um, it had a koi pond, a number of trees. Um, this was around monarch uh, butterfly season. So there were a lot of butterflies uh, flying around the flowers. And they spent an hour eating their lunch outside with no instructions other than that. Um, the other half of the group stayed inside and ate their lunch in the conference center like uh, uh, many of uh, my colleagues on this call have done uh, uh, hundreds if not thousands of times in our lives. And when they uh, brought folks back in, they redrew everybody's blood sample. So they drew a blood sample beforehand and a blood sample afterwards. And it's a pretty simple blood test to measure the length of your telomeres. And the people that had spent an hour outside in nature had measurably longer telomeres after just one hour of exposure to nature as compared to the folks that stayed inside. So this combination of oxidative stress, inflammatory disease, shortening of telomeres, this is the root of high blood pressure it's the root of obesity. It's the root of diabetes. It is the root of uh, heart disease and heart attacks. It's the setup for strokes. It is the primary cause of most cancers. It uh, contributes to over 100 different types of autoimmune disorders. Additionally, psychologically, it, it contributes to depression, anxiety, burnout, compassion fatigue, post-traumatic stress disorder or injury, and uh, suicide. And, uh, you know, even before coronavirus, people in EMS were at higher risk for all of these than the general public by a, by a wide margin. So the question is, what can we do to dial things down? And, and some people don't want to do anything. They can just choose to sit and suffer. Um, this does set you up for a, a likely long-term psychological injury. Uh, some people uh, use a maladaptive response to stress. Um, and in, uh, in, in the town I live in, uh, alcohol sales are up 55% since the start of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, and uh, reaching for high fat foods or using drugs or, or alcohol may feel like it relieves stress in the moment, but it actually causes uh, way more uh, complications and problems than, than that momentary uh, relief that you get from, uh, from the maladaptive responses. Uh, I've noticed some of my uh, EM, longtime EMS friends on Facebook are just taking early retirement um, as a, a strategy to get away from stress. Um, and, and that is, uh, uh, that is an, an okay uh, thing to do if you're able to do it. Um, some people try to change the stressor, um, which is really hard with coronavirus. Um, it, is, uh, it is very difficult um, to, uh, to change other people's behavior. I know a lot of people are really frustrated when um, other folks are not you know, wearing masks in, uh, in public places and uh, not practicing good hand hygiene. And we've, we've all seen the, the videos on, on Facebook and whatnot of, of people you know, spitting on store clerks that are asking them to wear masks. And, and one guy was actually shot and killed at a, uh, a dollar store um, up north um, for asking people to wear a mask. So, uh, trying to change the source of the stressor is really a challenge. Much better to try to change your own brain. And, and there are a number of, uh, number of ways to do that. You can, uh, you can train your brain to get back to that centered, um, safe spot that you had when you were uh, um, um, basically before you were born. Inside your mother's womb, this comes from... Uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Farr, who's an MD, PhD, 
uh, one of the world's leading experts in ad adverse childhood experiences and adolescent stress. And I was on a, a webinar with him recently and he said, you know, before you were born, um, you weren't hungry, you weren't thirsty, you were warm, you were in a moist environment, and you were constantly soothed by the rhythm of uh, your mother's heartbeat, both the vibrations and the sound. And he said, you know, that's, that's kind of the state we're trying to get back to with stress management. Um, so one of the strategies you can do, this is obviously not for while you're at work, but when you're off duty, you know, draw yourself a, a warm bath and uh, dim the lights a little bit, uh, put on a, a soundtrack of your, uh, your favorite music that has a, a rhythm between uh, 60 and 80 beats per minute. Um, as, as Chuck and I were talking about before this call, I'm a fan of the Grateful Dead. Uh, Stagger Lee is a wonderful song that has a, a, a beat of 72 beats per minute. Um, and there are a number of websites you can use to build your own soundtrack with the, the kind of music you like uh, that has a, a beat of between 60 and 80 per minute and put it on and, and relax in the bath. Um, just make sure that whatever device you're um, playing the music on does not fall into the bathtub. It would uh, suck to survive coronavirus only to be electrocuted. Uh, as part of your stress management strategy. Um, another uh, strategy that is uh, particularly effective is uh, learning to label your emotions in the moment when you're having them. Um, my uh, favorite example, this uh, comes from last summer. Uh, my wife, um, who has also gotten uh, very into this, she's the co-author of the book, um, had uh, served our son dinner. Our son is eight years old. And he was eating a rigatoni with marinara sauce. He likes a lot of marinara sauce. And he had uh, still had about half his bowl left, and he was eating it in front of the television, which I know is, is bad parenting, but we do it a fair amount anyhow. Um, and he was uh, bringing his bowl back into the kitchen, and he tripped on one of his mini Legos. And my wife, uh, Sasha, was standing, standing right there, and, and she really likes white furniture. So we have a white sofa. We have white club chairs. We have a white uh, dining room table. We have white paint on the walls. Um, and I saw that look on her face as she sees this um, kind of Jackson Pollock style Rorschach of red marinara sauce being sprayed toward all of her white stuff. You can imagine the look on her face, but she, she has been practicing stress management stuff. And she you know, caught herself and took a, took a quick breath and she muttered to herself, not I could barely hear her. She wasn't talking to us. She was talking to herself. She said, what am I really feeling right now? And uh, labeling your emotions is one of the key uh, stress management strategies. And, uh, and she said, when I'm feeling a surprise, and she looked at our, our son, Axe. She said, Axe, I'm, I'm surprised. Are you feeling surprised? And he looks up and goes, dang, mom, I'm surprised that surprise is the word that's coming out of your mouth right now. Um, and she said, well, let's, let's, just, uh, you know, let's just go together. And, uh, and clean this up. And, you know, six, seven months ago, that would have been a pissed off mom and an upset feeling bad little kid. Um, instead, it was just no big deal. Uh, mom and son getting, uh, getting together and cleaning things up. So labeling your emotions and getting used to really paying attention to how you're feeling and putting words to it is a, is a neuroscience based uh, strategy for reducing your stress. Uh, another is, you know, during the course of your day, um, whether you are, you know, running calls back to back, or if you're in, working in an uh, emergency department, taking care of a lot of patients, whatever your, your work role is, uh, pause and take just brief breaks. Um, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry says it only takes 90 seconds worth of kind of pulling out of whatever stressful thing you're experiencing um, to, to really reset. Uh, your body into a, a more um, relaxation state. So if you're a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, um, you know, pour that cup of coffee, pour that cup of tea, and don't look at your phone, you know, don't look at the television set. Just pay attention to your drink for a moment and let the aroma of the freshly brewed coffee fill your nostrils and see how that smells. And then when you take your first sip, let it sit in your mouth for a second so you actually really taste it um, before just swallowing the whole thing down to get your buzz or whatever. Um, but spend just a minute and a half just really paying attention and enjoying your drink. Chocolate also works really well for this. 
Another stress management strategy you might, uh, you might think about is to schedule a five minute a day worry session. Now, I know you're thinking, some of you are thinking at least, it, isn't stress management about stopping worrying, about not worrying so much? Um, and any of you who've worried and then you've tried hard not to worry, um, many of you probably experienced that that actually increases your worry. Um, so this technique is where you actually put it in your schedule, put it into your phone, uh, hit the uh, repeat so that you do it every day, same time every day, schedule a worry session for five minutes. And during that session, right at the beginning of that session, uh, set a timer on your watch or on your phone uh, so that you've got an alarm that goes off at the end. And then just worry like a banshee. Just go unrestrained. Don't try to hold anything back. Just worry, 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 just as intensely as you can. And then when the timer goes off, think or better yet, do something completely different so that you know your, uh, the, the advantage of this strategy is that when worries come up throughout the day, you can remind yourself that, hey, I don't need to worry about this right now. I have a worry session scheduled for myself at 7.30 tomorrow morning. Um, I encourage you not to schedule these worry sessions within three hours of bedtime because it'll screw up your sleep. Um, do them earlier in the day. But if you say, I, I can put that off because I've got a worry session coming up. And, and some people, they're, they're worried that they're going to forget what they're supposed to worry about. So they keep a little worry journal and they'll write it down. Um, others kind of go under the belief that, you know, if it's really serious enough that I really need to worry about it, I'll trust myself to remember it. And then when you're not on your worry time, just let yourself not worry. It's a very powerful strategy. Another uh, thing that has been uh, shown to be very effective from a neuroscience perspective um, is the practice of gratitude. And there are a lot of different ways uh, to practice gratitude. My wife and son and I uh, frequently do a, a three-item gratitude list where each of us uh, says three things that we're grateful for uh, before bed. That one actually enhances sleep. Um, and one of the things, since everybody's uh, finally washing their hands for 20 minutes, and isn't, is it disturbing to the rest of you that so, so many people seem to have just discovered hand washing like it's a brand new thing? Um, uh, but in any case, um, you know, we're all taught to sing the happy birthday song or the, the ABC song, or, or my, uh, my son was uh, taught to, to sing the baby shark song. And I apologize because that will stay in many of your heads now for a while. Um, but what I have uh, started doing is when I uh, wash my hands, um, I think in the left hand, what is something I'm grateful about myself for? Um, and um, self, the practice of self-gratitude, um, it's not about, you're not, you're not bragging, you don't have to tell anybody else what you're grateful for yourself about, but acknowledging things that you're doing okay, things that you're doing well, uh, something that you feel grateful for yourself about is a very powerful strategy to enhance mental health and decrease your stress. In the other hand, think of uh, something or somebody else um, that you're grateful for. Um, so uh, before uh, this session, after my breakfast, when I was uh, washing, uh, washing my hands in the bathroom, um, the, the first thing that came to me is I'm, I'm grateful for all of you. I am grateful for the leaders in EMS uh, in, the, in the state of Kentucky. Uh, for uh, doing the survey, for inviting me to, to do this presentation. And I'm really grateful for all of you uh, for signing up uh, to learn strategies to, to take care of yourselves. So that is a, that is a, a trick. Uh, we also already mentioned spending uh, time in nature. Um, if you've got a pet, it's wonderful. Take your dog for a walk, put your cat on your lap and pet it, whatever, uh, whatever you've got. Um, they can be really good stress management strategies. You know, taking an extra little bit of time, if you're somebody who normally takes a 10-minute shower, give yourself permission to take a 15-minute shower with that extra five minutes just being to really enjoy the shower. And, uh, you know, those of you that are parents, you've probably all been, uh, you know, focused on how do we reduce screen time. Um, and, and the reality is um, when, you're, when you're stuck at home as much as we are, uh, screen time is, is okay, and there's actually some good science that some screen time uh, can help you disengage from your stress and relax and dial your nervous system down as long as you're watching uh, something fun and relaxing and not sitting there watching the news, okay? Um, uh, video games are also another effective way to, 
to unplug a little bit, um, as is uh, reading a book. And I, I really encourage you uh, to think about um, reading a book with actual uh, pages in it for a change. Um, and the next is uh, a little uh, decision tree here. And this is the uh, can I, will I change it decision tree. So when you're dealing with something that's stressful, um, you know, like I, you know, was uh, uh, drove by one of our uh, beaches here a couple of days ago, and there were uh, dozens of people out in groups without masks on, clearly not paying attention to social distancing. And, and we don't have a big outbreak of, of coronavirus in our, in our little community here. Uh, but in our town of 10,000, we had, you know, 22 new cases yesterday, and we've had a few deaths. Um, and it's like, am I going to be able to change all of their mask wearing? Probably not. Um, but you ask the question, can I change what's bothering me? And will I change it? If you can, then change it. Just take action and change it. If it's something you can't change, or if it's something you're unwilling to change, just make a balloon out of it and let it go. Just let it go. Um, you've, all, uh, you've all seen pictures like this somewhere before, um, where there's a, an animal being chased by a big cat. And both of these animals are having an acute stress response. The gazelle in this case is having what's called a threat stress response. And the cat is having what's referred to as a challenge stress response. And um, <coughs> the threat stress response, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, uh, peripheral vascular constriction, looks very similar to the challenge stress response, which is increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, uh, peripheral vascular constriction, so the blood is available to the large muscle groups and whatnot. Um, but our body experiences a threat stress very differently than it does a challenge stress. Uh, prolonged, poorly managed threat stress is the root of all of the diseases we've talked about here uh, on the downside of stress. Whereas a challenge uh, stress response, a challenge stress response actually builds um, your resilience. It actually nurtures and lengthens your telomeres. It is healthy for you to deal with a challenge. So one of the tricks is to, uh, when you feel fear, is to talk it through in your mind and change that fear, that label, so that it feels like excitement. Um, that, that little shift can make a huge difference. Um, the, the psychological term for it is it's cognitive reappraisal. Um, so it is a strategy uh, for powerfully transforming uh, your fear stress into excitement and is, is nurturing for you. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of quick strategies that you can use to trick your nervous system into thinking that it's uh, relaxed and activating a parasympathetic nervous system response. So this is the, the GRACE framework uh, taught to me by uh, the late Aikido instructor, George Leonard. Um, and when you're feeling stress, the first part of the, the grace is ground. And uh, for this, what we do is we, uh, uh, with, your, with your toes, put your toes flat on whatever uh, uh, is underneath you right now as you're listening to this, and work your toes as if you were going to pull the rug or the carpet up underneath your feet. Um, the stress response causes uh, you to lose sensation in your uh, hands and feet so that if you get bit by a tiger, it won't hurt as bad and you can still uh, stay in the fight. Um, whereas uh, uh, if you uh, are moving your toes and returning your awareness uh, to your uh, sensation in your extremities, um, that is the opposite of a stress response, activates uh, the parasympathetic nervous system response. And uh, I, uh, I shared this in a webinar a few weeks ago and afterwards I got an email uh, from an F-16 fighter pilot um, who was um, getting ready to fly his, uh, one of his first missions over Iraq uh, during the Iraq conflict. And uh, he said his, uh, his squadron commander, uh, before they uh, closed the, the hatch to his aircraft, his squadron commander said, as you take off here, I want you to remember one thing. And he was thinking his commander was going to say, you know, pay attention to your aileron or, or uh, notice the, uh, the other, uh, constantly monitor other aircraft at your wingtips or, or something like that. And his uh, instructor said, wiggle your toes. And they go, looked up and said, wiggle my toes. And the instructor said, it'll keep, keep your head clear and it'll improve your flight performance if you wiggle your toes throughout your flight. 
And, uh, and I told that story uh, to the, I, I did a, a webinar like this for the faculty uh, for obstetrics and gynecology, all of the reproductive medicine uh, professors at the University of Pennsylvania uh, last week. And they said, you know, hey, when we've got uh, obstetrics patients that we're going to be performing uncomfortable procedures on, we always tell them to wiggle their toes. It's a, a strategy that's uh, uh, well-grounded. The R stands for relax. Uh, we all hold stress in different parts of our body. I tend to hold it in my neck and shoulders. So the relax is to just wiggle whatever part of your body you hold your stress in. Awareness is noticing stress as early as it comes on for you. So you have to spend a second to just pay attention to what are the signs of stress for you. Uh, for me, the first thing I notice is my peripheral vision gets a little fuzzy. And I'll notice that before I actually like consciously feel stressed. Um, and if I can catch it right then and take a couple of deep breaths or use uh, wiggle my toes or use one of these other strategies, um, I might be able to decrease that stress from building. Uh, the C is for center. And what I'd uh, like you to do right now is to hold, take it take one finger, uh, probably on your right hand, and poke it into your belly just two inches beneath your umbilicus, a couple inches beneath your belly button there. Um, and I hope there's nobody from Kentucky Human Resources on this, on this call, because I have just asked people all over the state to touch themselves uh, together simultaneously. But in any case, um, what, I, uh, what I want you to do is poke that finger into your belly, and then take a deep breath, into your belly and push your finger out with your breath. Push your finger out with your breath. That aspect of centering um, will uh, decrease uh, your stress response. And the last is to energize, and that means to um, use your, uh, your hands and rub your hands together and actually warm up the skin of your hands. Just like uh, dropping into a hot bathtub, um, that is a, a really useful strategy uh, for countering uh, the stress response. Like I mentioned earlier, I encourage you to think about uh, practicing mindfulness meditation. Um, I have been a daily meditator since I was 14. Uh, back when I first started doing it, it was only something that weird California hippies did. I will admit that. Uh, but as the science has evolved around it, um, it has become a mainstay. This is the Chicago Police Department uh, doing their daily uh, meditation that they do at the beginning of every shift. Um, all branches of the U.S. military uh, practice some form of mindfulness. If you want to learn more about it, I strongly encourage you to uh, look up uh, the books by, uh, by Dr. Dan Siegel. Um, and lastly here, I want to just mention uh, uh, one, one principle of leadership that's important. And that is um, that our, our limbic system, that seat of our emotions that we talked about, um, you know, we show it on pictures like this as if it were inside your skull. Um, but the, the limbic system is actually a, an open loop nature function, um, meaning that it is, it is relational, it is interpersonal. Um, the open loop nature of your limbic system is what allows parents to calm upset children. And, uh, and those of you that have, uh, ha have infants or have had infants or grandkids, um, and you're, uh, and you're uh, rocking uh, the, the child, trying to calm them down when they're upset. Um, if you pay attention, you'll notice uh, that uh, the rate at which you rock, uh, when it hits about 80, uh, 80 rocks per minute, um, that's when the children get most calm, kind of recreating that uh, inside the womb experience for them. But as a leader, um, research has shown that you, how you show up, your level of stress can alter the hormone levels, cardiovascular functions, sleep rhythms, and immune functions in other people. And we've all seen this when somebody's in a group and one person yawns and then a bunch of other people yawn. Um, and, and so it is, it's, it's contagious. And so if you're the leader, it's like being in the front row of a, a roller coaster and everybody behind you, if you're having your emotional ups and downs and you're kind of all over the place, Everybody behind you is having ups and downs and kind of all over the place. So as a leader, it's even more important for you to practice these calming strategies so that as you connect with the people on your team, they can take their cues from you and relax themselves. So as leaders, it's really important for us to make sure our folks feel connected with. Um, and, you know, with this time of social distancing and all this kind of stuff, many people have screwed up their eating and their hydration and those kinds of things. 
So we have a responsibility to make sure our people can eat, that they stay hydrated, that they have adequate personal protective equipment, and make sure you include everybody, your mechanics and your housekeepers and your dispatchers, they're all affected by this stuff. Couple of resources uh, for you to, to think about. Um, a company I work for, First Watch, um, offers a, uh, a resilience building uh, system. Uh, you can go to our, uh, our website here at uh, firstwatch.net and uh, look at Resilient First. It can, it's, a, it's a system that will um, give you a, a way to assess your own resilience, takes about three minutes, and then drop you into a really cool just five minute a day artificially intel intelligence uh, powered strategy for developing it. Um, the book uh, comes out next week. Um, this is the, the website, uh, combatcovidstress.com. If you uh, wanna be notified when it's published, you can sign up there. Um, and if you uh, feel like you need a little more support, maybe a little therapy or, or something to uh, connect with, uh, your state has got great resources. And uh, this organization, the All Clear Foundation, um, has uh, probably the best collection of online therapists and support groups and, and all that kind of stuff, all geared uh, for police, fire, and EMS folks of any place I've ever seen. Um, so as we come to a close here, uh, my hope is that you, uh, you're able to stay cool. That is our eight-year-old uh, son, Axe. He is, uh, has to show up at every slideshow at least once. And I really uh, thank you for your, uh, your time and attention and uh, your commitment to taking care of yourselves and other people. So I will uh, turn it over to, to folks for your CE connection here. Thank you, Mike, for being with us so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. It was a great presentation. Bob, Andrew, I'm going to turn the screen over to you, allow you to speak to folks about CE credit. I want to thank Mike Tagman uh, from First Watch for providing the stress management webinar for KBMS and Kentucky EMS providers and all the EMS providers that took the time to attend this important stress management webinar. One thing I wanted to share was this is the second time I've attended this webinar this month and it still held my attention. And I think that speaks for the value of this training because that's unusual for me to attend a training twice like that and it still hold my attention. So thanks Mike for the important information you shared with us on the stress management. I know that uh, on the slides there, I noticed uh, in the announcement that there's a book coming out. Mike had mentioned that, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm going to go to the link that I've also shared on the site myself to uh, reserve a copy of that or find out how to get one. What you see on the slide is uh, a bit.ly link, which takes you to a SurveyMonkey continuing education evaluation. This survey only takes you less than three minutes, if that. It mainly gives you a five question rating for the training and mic, and we'll share that with him. It also asks for some demographics. It's very important that you spell your name correctly. This is how it will appear on your course completion certificate that we will email you uh, the first week in July. Make sure you also use the correct email and take your time when you're putting your email into the survey because this is how we're going to reach out to you. If the email is incorrect, we'll make an attempt to find you in the KEMSYS system. That's why we are asking for your KEMSYS number. So I'm going to read off the link to you because until we get the post video uh, up on the website under the education banner on the KBEMS website at kyems.com, you will need to uh, enter this link into your web browser. So if you all want to do that now uh, or write this down, take a picture of the screen with your phone. That's my favorite thing to do. And then right after this training, uh, complete this survey. And then uh, visit that second site there uh, about Mike's uh, upcoming book. So HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash covid covid dash stress s t r e s s dash management m a n a g e m e n t dash c e u uh, supercharger stress management in the age of covid nineteen handbook you can find more information on that at the www.combatcovidstress.com. 
And that's all I have, Mike. And uh, thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Mike, uh, for being with us again today. We encourage everybody to check out combatcovidstress.com and firstwatch.net for information on First Watch products and Resilient First. Make sure that you complete your evaluation. We will uh, share the evaluation comments with Mike Tagman. And Mike, thank you so much again for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, for having me. You folks do epic work.